yeah, thanks for making it to our events. I know there's like a lot of events going on for SF Climate Week, so it's really special to be able to share this with all of you. Um, I'm just seeing. I'm a designer and artist. I also live here, and um, this is Lucia. Hi, I'm Lucia. I am a producer, a poet, a DJ sometimes, <laughs> and I used to live here. Our creators, a really good DJ. <laughs> just so you know. Um, yeah, so we're in Agape. This is our community home. Um, there's 14 people living here. Some of you might have been here before and have like partied with us many a time, or maybe this is a new place for you. And um, welcome. We wanted this place to be feel really like comfy and cozy and just like a living room type of events where you can just feel at home. So I hope you do. <laughs> uh, we'll be hearing from four speakers tonight. And um, we got Spencer, and Natalia, Bruna, and Sandra. Um, they'll be sharing their perspectives on what climate action is from that, from their perspective and lens, and um, some insights from the work that they do. Um, if anyone needs to go to the bathroom, there's a, there's a restroom just down that hallway to the lift. And if you need anything else, feel free to ask one of us. Um, but yeah, without further ado, I think we can get started with our speakers. So we have Natalia first up. So Natalia is work at IDEO um, and her works of art explore future innovation and climate action. She brings over a decade of climate experience from the U.S. Department of Energy all the way to Project Drawdown. Thank you. <laughs> How do I take the slide? Okay. <laughs> How's everyone doing? Good. Made a small phone, no? It's my best time. I'm great. I'm coming. Um, lovely. Well, I'm really happy to be here with you. And um, I'm just going to share a little bit about what we're up to at IDEO around climate action. Um, and there's a ton of people uh, here actually this evening that are working on parts of this. So uh, there's a little row in the back. But if you want to hear about other parts of this world. Um, there are lots of people to connect that. Um, are you going to advance for me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Next slide. <laughs> so I'm uh, this week, uh, just kind of curious about what questions are emerging. Um, you know, a lot of these about there's, there's, um, pitches and there's like a, an agenda and I'm, I'm often just curious sort of what are people asking each other because I want to figure out where we're, where we're pointing. So I have some questions for you quickly and then we'll get into what idea is up to. So I'm just curious, um, raise your hand if, as you're going about climate week, um, you're finding more reasons to be hopeful. Okay, optimist. Or um, reasons to despair. Oh wait, okay, so we've done it twice. Some of you cheated. Okay, let's uh, To make progress, it's better to think of nature as a commodity. No, nope. all right, uh, a sacred trust. And yet we are Quantifying so much. The potential of edge technology it is cause for optimism. Weak, weak hands are going up. A distraction we can't afford. Cool. Okay. Interesting. There's a little bit more on the second side. Um, and lastly, there's no seven months. Good, no good future without growth. Okay. Without degrowth. Or green growth. Interesting. Split. Okay. And I think the last one, the future of climate action is knowable. <laughs> okay, no hint. Uh, <laughs> is shapeable. Very interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think, I mean, all these questions are coming up in, in the spaces that we're moving through and um, in the work that I'll show you where we're doing a little bit of like speculative design about what could be possible in the coming decades. Um, and if you saw a hand go up that you disagree with, it's always interesting to find people after and, and get into something we've done some of this stuff. Uh, so IDEO is a, a, a design, innovation, strategy, consultancy. Um, everything from the things that you hold and, and have in your home to the strategies that shape um, governments and large corporations and big NGOs. Uh, this was not this year's eclipse, but a uh, prior one. And um, yeah, this is like a little sample of, of kind of what the work looks like, but digital, physical, a lot of thinking. And if you go to the next, um, what I want to share with you today is what we're learning about using futuring to 
uh, inspire people to take action around climate change. Um, so that's within organizations and leadership um, and with the consumers that they're working with. So I'll talk to you about um, through our theory of change, some stories, and then how we're bringing that to life um, through artifacts. Theory of change. Uh, so this is work. Actually, can you guess the year? Anyone know? Do you have to guess? 2008. 2008, 2009. Is this 2003? Someone just said, yeah, it was three or four um, for Intel before the iPhone came out and before the um, like AirPod, the new smartwatch. Um, so I wouldn't say that idea of predicted the future, but we were definitely like experimenting with what could be possible around technology, connection, social networks, wearables. Um, and so we have, you know, this, this way of exploring what the future could hold by making things really tangible, things that you can experience and feel and step into. Um, and so what we're learning, one thing we're learning is um, futuring is helping us and leaders really to build confidence to say yes to more ambitious possibilities. So we bring it in at the beginning of like a strategy project and we say, here's what the future could look or feel like. Um, what do you want to do in response to that working backwards to today? Uh, we're never trying to predict things completely accurately. It's a lot more about the thought experiment, like uh, ideating around what, what could be possible. Um, and a lot of this work that we're seeing out in the ecosystem is really text heavy. I mean, there's a role for that. Um, but if you go to the next one, we have to go beyond reports. Um, it's like the IPCC dropped one, I think, last year uh, or the year before with a bunch of um, fictional scenarios. And they brought to life really compelling, well-researched um, possibilities. But they're really hard for the public to grasp. They didn't make mainstream news other than the sort of rough headlines. So um, we're casting around and we're looking and we're finding... Um, Future and work around climate, but it's coming from strange places. Chobani made this, um, so that it's a yogurt company, uh, and it's one of the most widely started. They hired Studio Ghibli, so it's beautiful work, but um, you know, it's coming from strange places, and, and we just need more of it. We need different sectors of people to be envisioning this stuff. Um, so we're doing a little bit of that artifacts and impact. Next slide. Uh, for the last year ish, we've been coming up with speculative products and services that we never plan to take to market. We don't think they should really exist, but we're curious about what would happen if they did. Um, so we're tracking different trends and then we're bringing them to life through objects. So what does the future of electrification look like? Um, what happens if we move to a completely regenerative circular economy? Uh, what would it look like if we had a different relationship with nature um, and, and going from there? So these are some of the early versions that we're doing digitally. And then we started getting into, um, well, what if we bring these to life and bring them to places where leaders are convening? So, I mean, some examples, we, we made a newspaper um, from the future, which you can see here um, with headlines. And if you go forward, um, and then we brought some of these artifacts that we staged them in an exhibit with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. They do circular economy, um, sort of like think tank and projects with companies. Uh, so we set up this like home from the future, uh, like living room, kitchen, you know, closet. I'll make people walk through. Go to the next one. Um, and the next. And we had them look at um, postcards that might exist, mail that they might get. If you, um, you know, really rough products, but like what if Ikea stole, sold a uh, mycelium, you know, self-constructs uh, stool, muscle thought. So, um, what if you, you know, dyed your, your own clothing at home with the dyes that you were growing? Uh, what if you really needed a support group because there was pressure for you to be uh, reducing your waste and maybe you're getting taxed at the individual level? So you're you're in the bathroom and running into self-help lines for uh, leaving consumption. Uh, you can go to the next. Uh, what if you could really track all of the information about your the things that you're wearing? And a, a garment had a life that was, you know, 100 years, and then you could see who owned it and what, was, what it was made out of, where it came from. Um, what if you had a card where you could rent anywhere, anytime, any garment from any store, Nike, H&M, Chanel, um, to make it more of a circular economy? Um, what kind of fines would we get in that time? And what departments might they come from? The Ministry of Regeneration? Repeat. And then we were like, okay, well, what if we go to COP, um, the, the Big Gun Climate Conference, uh, we were part of a, a wider IDEO effort with a number of um, creative firms, rented out a warehouse. Um, we had a lot of events and 
but part of it, we staged um, some of these features as well. So here we are setting up and then go to the next. Uh, again, we staged, we expanded from the home, we did the office, we did um, like a public square in Jakarta, this one was in Peru, Dubai. Um, and then we had people come through. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, we asked them to step in 2030 to anchor on the um, the UN sort of target uh, timeline. And we had new artifacts um, relating to uh, the kinds of ads we might find um, in the future. So that last one was, was posters in a, in a market advertising um, plastics made from shellfish, which is chitin, the kind of bioplastic or um, uh, yeah, swapping and, and recycling cooperatives. Um, you know, this is currency reimagined. Right now, we think of infrastructure that we need for the grid to be really, um, it, it's not beautiful. People don't want it in their backyard. But what if it was this, uh, you know, treasured national pride and so much that we put it on our, our um, currency? Um, again, the, the emissions and sort of um, live reporting on garments. Um, what if we rewilded a lot of urban spaces? because um, the public square in Jakarta, um, what might artificial intelligence help us uh, do in connecting to and understanding animals? Um, there's work being done to translate or at least better understand whale language. Um, so we were like, well, uh, we're seeing companies put nature on the board through a proxy of a human representative. If we had some way to communicate in many, many years, um, could those, those creatures join us in deciding uh, the choices that we make? And then we had people come up with their own features uh, and create artifacts. Um, and so, yeah, so we're, we're thinking about how to bring these to life and how to bring people in. And the last thing is, um, it's very nice if we do it kind of theoretically by ourselves in a vacuum, um, even if people come through, uh, but we wanted to get in front of the right people. So we started, uh, we have been working with different groups on creating, um, somewhat immersive experiences, they, they start to get closer to the near term and less sort of far future. Um, but the goal is to bring to life, what if you stepped into what could be possible uh, around climate action? So we ran um, a series of pilots with groups um, that you saw there. So a bunch of retailers and then some VCs and conservancies. Um, and we asked if, uh, if retail was more environmentally friendly, what are some things that would change? And the one that we decided to circle in on um, after doing some featuring workshops was alternative materials and the circular economy. So we found a bunch of startups. Um, Sway is based in the Bay, uh, so I brought them up here. Um, we brought these startups technologies into these pilots and we got them in front of consumers and for about three weeks, um, maybe a month, uh, in the Bay Area, you could go to a store like a Walmart or Target or CVS and get your groceries in a Sway um, material. Uh, or you could try a reusable bag and then take it home and then bring it back. Um, and it's not something that exists at scale today, but it allowed people to kind of test, well, what would it feel like if we had fully reusable systems? So here you can see them testing out our experiments. Um, and what that really does is it signals to the market and it helps um, to prove out that that will have eventually some pathway. Um, so those startups went on to raise um, 12 million collectively. Um, and then we were working with Conservation International. Um, Connor, who's in the back, really led a lot of this work. Uh, we have used, um, among many tools, including strategy um, and, and um, different kinds of creative work with them, featuring to help uh, get some visioning going around how they might align strategy across the African continent. Um, they have different field offices, uh, but really need to create a, uni a unified perspective to both fundraise and to execute their work and scale the great work that they were doing. Actually, see if you go back one. Um, so we got a bunch of um, workshops, some on featuring, some on strategy, um, and came up with ideas for for what 2030 might look like for them. Um, and then through a lot of strategy work aligned, um, and they just recently last year signed an agreement with this um, other NGO in Africa that will be scaling the work that they're doing um, on range lens uh, to, to many other countries and creating transboundary corridors, which is great. And all I've said is um, we're working with the Rockefeller Foundation uh, currently. Um, and this one is thinking about futures through the lens of leaders in Latin America who are creating startups, projects, um, they're experimenting with um, 
setting biodiversity baselines, uh, experimenting with tracking uh, technology and surveillance to find areas of deforestation. Uh, and they're running experiments that we think will serve as anchors for the COP30 that's coming up in Brazil, where people will be asking questions about how technology and nature relate um, and how we can work with the people that are really living on and stewarding land. Um, so I think of this as featuring a sense of uh, we're seeing early signals and, and trying to really uplift people that are doing great experiments and work that will be very needed as we continue to scale uh, nature-based solutions. So just a few stories of um, what we're thinking about, what we're making, and how it's showing up with company. And that's really all I wanted to share. And if any of that's interesting, I'm happy to chat after. Um, I would love to hear if you're also making things related to possible futures. Woo. Thanks. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Natalia. Up next, we have Spencer Scott. What? Spencer is a systems thinking scientist and writer and climate solutions expert at One Earth. Uh, he's focused on decarbonization models and implementation. Him and his husband, Nick, co founded Solar Punk Farms, a demonstration site uh, and climate hug in Burnville. <laughs> on a mission to make ecological civilization seem not just possible, but irresistible. Uh, and Spencer will be focusing on climate solutions and optimistic visions of the future as aspirational motivations for climate action. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Dan. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and so glad I didn't prepare slides because I would never want to follow IDEO. This is incredible. So instead, we're going to do a story hour for 10 minutes. Um, and I think I just kind of wanted to walk through my process and journey into climate. Um, I My background is in bioengineering. I got my PhD at AC San Diego. I worked in synthetic biology. Um, I used to work at a cancer therapeutic biotech company in the East Bay. Um, and kind of around 2018, when the IPCC report came out, um, I just kind of had this like change of heart and it was just like, I want to work in climate. And I, my whole life, I had been a writer um, and I just felt like my lab job wasn't creative in a way that was fulfilling me. Um, and so I took climate as, as kind of like the exit strategy with truly too much naivete and just like I left a little bit up, much uh, planned, um, which was scary and probably not the wisest decision, but it worked out. Um, and I I was good at research and I wanted to write. And so I just stepped into climate education um, and I just started talking to as many people as possible, reading every book I could about climate. Um, I read Drawdown. Um, I actually ended up working with Paul Hawkins, who wrote Drawdown on his second book, Regeneration. Um, and, and so then my husband and I, uh, we were living in the Castro at the time and we were thinking about, you know, we, we think about climate and, and as this very like theoretical, we're in our heads in books and we just really felt the missing component of being, um, like having some sort of physical and c connection to the work we were doing. Um, and so we kind of ideated this concept of starting a farm. Um, and so that was like 2019, we started looking, we went to Oregon. Um, we realized Oregon was too far away from our community in San Francisco. Um, and then COVID happened in 2020 and it kind of like sped up our timeline of, okay, let's do this. Let's go look. And from the get go, um, we knew we wanted the space to be, um, and climate education and demonstration site. And right around the time we were looking for a farm, um, my husband's cousin emailed us about solar punk. And for those who don't know what solar punk is, it um, is basically this concept that our imaginations have been populated a lot with dystopian media and stories from cyberpunk and steampunk. Um, and solar punk was like, we need to start populating our imaginations with positive, attractive futures. So we know what we're working for, what we're working forward. And so the easiest way to summarize solar punk is like you say, solar punk asks, what does an ecological civilization look like? 
and how do we get there? And I, and I think what was so amazing about solar punk was that it from the get go wasn't just an aesthetic. It was, um, ultimately a, a, an activism and a philosophy towards making that vision a reality. Um, and so that's what we wanted to do with our farm. Um, and, and so the whole goal of our farm is to bring people up from the city or from anywhere, um, and, and let them experience, you know, what does a life based around climate centered values look like, taste like, feel like. Um, and so the, yeah, if, if you're interested in that, um, come visit us and you can find us on Instagram, Solar Punk Farms. Um, and so that at the same time, because life has realities, um, I, we were both looking for jobs and then I uh, now work at a climate nonprofit called One Earth. Um, and One Earth does incredible things. They started out of the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation. Our executive director, Justin Winters, started the, the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation and eventually left to start One Earth. Um, and the whole kind of arc of One Earth was finding the gaps in what um, people needed in order to invest or donate their money and climate solutions. And so I work on the science team at One Earth, and I work on kind of two main projects. One is called the One Earth um, Solutions Taxonomy or Solutions Framework, uh, and that is based on a lot of different scientific studies, primarily one climate energy model that outlines you know, how do we decarbonize and get to renewable energy by 2050 and hopefully keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and then we have this other scientific project called the Global Safety Net that maps all of the Earth's lands based on biodiversity and carbon sequ sequestration potential. Um, and that is really helping um, countries and local organizations make decisions about how to conserve and protect um, plant. And all of those add up to our framework that has 75 solutions to climate change, all backed by uh, a good science with intersectional um, stains and levers of change. And I also, um, through that project, we've started to map financial flows into climate solutions. Um, and the goal of that project is if you can see the solution space via our framework and you can see where money is going, you can hopefully find projects that aren't being funded, um, that are underfunded and very important. Um, so that is, um, what I do at One Earth is like kind of, kind of like a climate solutions generalist, um, and I'm working on defining those solutions, um, and then ultimately, ultimately helping, uh, get more money in nature conservation and biodiversity protection. So, um, yeah. And, and because I wasn't doing enough, I, I'm, I'm also, <laughs> I'm also a writer. Um, and I think, you know, as I was preparing for this, I was kind of just seeing where these different things are satisfying in my life. Like the, the one earth was at this very, you know, global level. Um, and it's kind of when you get into climate, you start, you know, you like keep peeling back these layers where you, you start to think like, oh, climate is like a carbon dioxide problem. Um, and then you realize climate is a power problem. And it's like a, and then at, at the very end, you're like, it's an ontological problem. It's, it's how we define ourselves. It's how we think of the world and how we show up and interact and build relationships. Um, and so I think I'm kind of working on each of those layers at different times. Um, I think the, the work I do in One Earth that, I mean, it has a lot of, uh, the organization is incredible in how it's interacting all across the board. And it, but it really, like what I work on is this very kind of like mechanistic um, and material, like pragmatic sense, like there is a lot of money concentrated in places that needs to flow to, to things that need money. Um, in order to regenerate um, the health of our ecosystems. And then I think our, our farm is very much more um, focused on culture. And so what we try to do on the farm is create a space that is so exciting to come to. And I, and I was talking about this someone beforehand, but um, you know, someone said, you, you need to make the revolution irresistible. And so that is our ultimate goal is like, we want it to be, uh, so much fun. Um, and it needs to be this thing that is self-sustaining uh, based on intrinsic values and um, that can keep you going. 
And then I think my writing is is geared towards um, explaining that process that you go through as your values change and the things that you find resistance as you try to make those changes um, and kind of making sense of, you know, the, the society we grew up in and, and what pressures were there and where that, pre- where that made you focus your attention and kind of coming to, okay, I'm getting a lot of information right now about what's going on in the world. What does that mean about what I value, who I am, um, what sort of future am I working towards? And um, sorry, just saw my husband that threw me off. And no, he's really here. Anyway, uh, yeah, I think that that, that piece has been um, <laughs> uh, super important and related to all three all at once. To, they all kind of go together. Um, so I think that that's kind of the bulk of what I wanted to share. Um, I think as we think about the futuring aspect, um, I think these positive visions are super important. Um, and we can look to practical advice about, you know, what are the, what, what are the practical things, the material things that are going to happen in this world? Um, but let's also talk about the ways that that's going to change you and what you find important, um, and how we can build community around that. Thank you so much, Spencer. Up next, we're going to hear from Sandra Kwap. Sandra is an executive strategist and systems thinker motivated by a passion for sustainability. She is the founder and CEO of Ten Power, a social impact enterprise that works with Native American tribal nations on energy sovereignty. And she's going to be sharing about the way that she is leveraging the Inflation Reduction Act capital to support the sovereignty of renewable energy. So welcome. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much, Agape, for hosting us. Happy you're here. Sandra Kwok, and um, I do a couple of things. It's my social impact enterprise called Ten Power. Can y'all do that with me? Ten Power. Do you ever forget? Count your fingers. I'm also a singer in the Sea Stars. We create regenerative harmonies for a future that's possible. And um, I do a lot of activism outside of a consulting firm on regenerative design principles. And um, yeah, fighting for the climate every day and every night. Hey, we can regenerate humans. <laughs> so I started Ten Power in 2015 in Haiti with the goal of creating energy access in places that don't have access to electricity. Um, we have a gender empowerment lens, so anything that we do has a focus on workforce development and uh, people who are traditionally left out of the workforce. And currently we're focused on supporting Native American tribal nations with accessing all the money in this historic moment to build renewable energy projects for climate justice. And uh, we basically meet communities wherever they're at. So for some communities that looks like helping with engineering skills, it helps with strategic planning, project development. In Haiti, we had to get really creative about assembling capital stacks. So bringing in equity, bringing in debt, bringing in grants, creating all, all types of crazy financing mechanisms. Same is true working with tribes right now, inflation action cap and inflation IRA, let's just call it that. <laughs> the, the reduction act capital gets you about 80% and then there's tax incentives that get you 80% of that and you have this leftover. Maybe it's like $10 million on a $100 million project. So where does that come from? Philanthropy ideally. And then, and then we're always investing in our local ecosystems. So some of the projects that we did in Haiti, we put solar in UNICEF Haiti. It was the largest microgrid on any UNICEF in the world at the time of installation in 2018. During the pandemic, we built a solar powered water desalination plant that's now providing clean drinking water to 40,000 people. And we launched a women's solar. Oh, this was also during the pandemic. This is actually um, post assassination of the release as things have been kind of disintegrating into chaos in Haiti. And um, this was actually a project that was sponsored by the Sierra Club. And we put solar in a kind of clinic in a little area with an maternity ward. And we had to sneak the paddles in, in an ambulance to make sure that the gang didn't interfere with them. And well, so this is um, some photos from our women's workforce development program. Every single one of these women is invited by Luke Whistler to Stoller. This program is launched in partnership with Haiti Tech University. And we're now applying all of our learnings from Haiti to working with tribes. So first and foremost, our home learner attitude, right? The community is an expert on the community. They know more than you ever will coming in from outside. 
And um, it's really, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be doing this work. And it's been so illustrated to me, you know, where's the one tribe relations, how integrated everything is, just sharing something in conversation for those. So coming to ADM is like kilowatt hour, productive use of electricity, right? Like people need to be you know, stuff to like save lives and in life or death situations and surgery, right? Like kids need lights to you on here. For tribes, it's about removing the dam that was built in 1928 to bring back the salmon to restore the entire ecosystem because water is life, right? It's, it's not about the kilowatt. And then now I'm just like Spencer was saying, right? Or like, oh, it's a carbon problem, right? It's a climate problem. No, it's a, it's a mental problem. All of us need to re indigenize our relationship with the planet and get back to what we have forgotten. Evolution is going this way. And somewhere around the birth of capitalism and colonialism, humans started going this way. And we've all seen what happens to species who have those boom cycles, right? Outstrip their natural resources, there's a bust. So it's really up to those of us who are awake, alive, pay attention to start steroid ship around so we can reconverge with evolution. And it's going to be an awkward couple of hundred years, y'all. But I'm here for it. It is a work of lifetimes. So we're working with tribal nations and sourcing their money project development, workforce development, and um, we're doing some really amazing projects. This one is with an Alaskan native village, about 40 minutes outside of Anchorage. And um, they're actually the largest landholder in the Anchorage area. And these spruce beetles have come up and decimated their forestry, their forest lands, and it's this standing wildfire risk. And the Klutner tribal village wants to bring back indigenous forestry practices to go in and cull the dead timber, because the poles are warming at four times less than the planet, so the Arctic is experiencing a climate change at an even more drastic rate than everyone else, and it's already drastic. And, uh, and so, so we want to be able to sell a saleable timber and biogasify the, the municipal timber, create biochar, which can remediate the soil and heat for greenhouses for year-round food sovereignty in Alaska, where milk could cost $12 a gallon in the middle of winter. And this will create a program in turn that can cultivate first foods, medicines. My buddies up there want to do plant tissue cultures, patent the seeds, have the grandmothers hold the patents so Monsanto can't get a hold of them, and then create an intertribal trade platform. I mean, hey, this is the kind of stuff that AI should be used for, right? So um, that's one example of many really cool little projects that we're doing. I mean, it was on the front lines of the Stop Line 3 movement, actually, I was pregnant with this one. I you know, linked up with Leona the Duke, who's a badass women modern protector. She was uh, twice the vice presidential candidate for the United States with Rose Leader, the Davis Green Party. And uh, she has an organization that is working in the Great Lakes region. And uh, we're working on a microgrid for a tribal school and elderly center that is um, it's gonna be creating climate justice and resilience for that community. And she just bought back the conventional potato farm on the other side of the highway that was spraying pesticides that were drifting over into the stew boots. And um, I'm mean, going to do a community microgrid there that can go serve the whole tribal community as well as people around the area. So um, our vision, in conjunction with the tribes that we'll work with, is for indigenous energy when we build a sovereignty for tribal nations. Just because it's green doesn't mean it's not colonist. So green colonialism, it's a thing. There are giant wind companies that are coming to reservations where people have already got the worst land in the United States, and they're like, oh, here's a terrible wind lease for pennies on the dollar, right? That's just as extractive as coal. And um, so it's really important that projects be tribally owned and operated, and that there are, there are pathways for people to participate, so that they're truly creating energy sovereignty. Um, be friends with us. You can take pictures if you want, or right, let's talk after this. And uh, that's 10 power. So now transitioning to what I do when I'm not working, is um, street activism. So I am really tired of this incremental approach, right? Like we're doing cool projects, but it's, you know, like some kilowatts there, maybe a lot there, right? Like it, it feels it feels like little droplets in the ocean of the problem. And um, so part of my therapy is um, getting out a megaphone and yelling at banks. <laughs> I do with Extinction Rebellion. <laughs> and um, Extinction Rebellion is pretty young organization that's one of the fastest growing in climate movement. We're living through the sixth mass extinction, right? Um, it's the first one that's really caused by a conscious species, us. And, um, and so one of the first things that 
you're invited to do a movement is to process the grief. And the way that I like to do that is through SARC. <laughs> so this is, um, you know, with ecological footprint, you're supposed to calculate your carbon footprint. I actually think it's one of the largest gas lightings that has ever happened in any of those three because these giant corporations are photos, oh, it's your fault, you use less straws. Where's the supplier responsibility, right? Where's the producer responsibility? We're looking at, I mean, this is, this is legit. This is where carbon emissions are coming from. We need sign trans transformation and every single level. But over 70 global emissions, this report just came out last week, 70% of emissions have come from 78 entities in oil, gas, coal, and cement. So this is a pretty clear area of focus. So if you want to get to the solution, target the problem. And then these are the major banks that are financing those projects that those companies are conducting. And um, the board members of the dirtiest banks in the United States are 77% the same people who are on the boards of those fossil fuel companies. So we're seeing all these headlines, right? Renewables are growing, the most jobs, right? the, most, the fastest growth is in renewables. And so why are the banks still investing in these fossil fuel companies that are exploiting new assets? They're creating these wells that are just spewing out into the atmosphere because these same people are getting richer as those projects. So um, this was a game that we did where um, we played our giant monopoly board. We put it up in front of the banks and, um, and we had the, the bankers playing monopoly. And they're like, ah, all right, drill in the Amazon. What do you think? Like, should we go ahead this morning? No, 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 like, we're going to do it anyways. Legit <laughs> 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 uh, stuff that Wells Fargo is actually chewing. <laughs> um, so, what does XR stand for? We want to reduce demand. We want to cut off the supply of capital, stop the money pipeline, invest in renewable energy, restructure our transportation systems, regen ag, baby, restoration of our ecosystems. We want to draw down. Thank you. We're all connected. And how do we do it? We've studied a lot of nonviolent movements and drawing and following best practices and respect and the learning framework towards action that created a strategic disruption, sacrificial, and value in the And I like to add fun because if you throw the best party, and they did what I knew right? What's the Buckminster Fuller quote? Like, you don't, you don't have to destroy the system. Just create a better system that will make the other obsolete. So um, this was a playful puppet spray that we organized to see on the Endangered Species Act. Um, this is when we addressed my baby if I was a judge and did a citizen's last and see it was far to judge psychic generations. <laughs> um, this was this morning. We, we actually um, were occupying the last far. I got, I got the jazz support number. On my own, and um, we were writing um, or reading stories for the front lines in San Luis Obispo, and um, what do you do? Same all that the dirge. Bye. Bye. So not only stories for the projects, the people on the front lines are getting brutalized by the police, and um, we were singing to the bankers. We deem and a green future as love and rage we sing. A motherland we must nurture. Let our voices ring. And six scientists got arrested. So um, it's uh, interesting that people who are closest to the data are willing to get arrested for our collective future. So yeah, these are kind of the big questions. What does it look like to be a good ancestor? And then so many indigenous cultures say, you know, every decision you make, you should think seven generations of the future. I like to think about this shit storm that we're living in, how it's the result of seven generations and to see those that go. And that's what seven generations is gonna look like from now, based on what we know and the decisions that we're making right here, right now. Yeah, XR is born in the UK. In 2019, it spread on the world, and we love doing stunts, we love doing art, we love doing street theater, giant murals. I think if something is beautiful, then it piques your curiosity, and you're a lot more likely to let that message enter your brain. So that's a little bit of my work. Thank you so much for my group.
Thank you so much. Um, last but certainly not least, we have Bruno Olmeya Quiroa. Bruno is a culture and technology strategist, passionate about leveraging culture to shift systems. He is the re director of strategy at Good Energy, an entertainment consultancy working with major Hollywood studios to change um, in fictional TV and film. To, uh, sorry, to represent to change the representation of climate change in fiction and TV and film. Most recently, he co-led, this is super cool, by the way, just fangirling with us, I think. <laughs> Most recently, he co-led the development of the Climate Reality Check, which is a vector test for climate on screen. Sick. We'll talk about it a little. Yes, please. So, Bruno will be unpacking how narrative change transforms climate culture and systems through Hollywood and TV. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me out there. Um, and I apologize to the this technical presentation is 15 minutes long, um, which I will start a timer for. But welcome to the narrative change for the climate crisis session. Uh, as was just said, we're going to unpack how storytellers are leveraging entertainment to transform climate culture and systems. Uh, my name is Bruno Melo Quiroga. Uh, I was born and raised in Cochabamba, Bolivia, but I live in Miami now, from last night. Um, and I am the director of strategy of Good Energy. Uh, we're a nonprofit that leverages the power um, of Hollywood to unlock the potential of storytelling in TV and film to inspire courage and action in the face of climate change. So we support storytellers of scripted TV and film, specifically fictional, um, as they represent climate change on screen. Um, and before I start, Please raise your hand if you feel like a movie or a show has ever changed you. You did. Hunt and famous star in Great. Um, second question, please change your mind. Uh, raise your hand. On Twitter, man. Raise your hand if you've ever been a designated driver, and I promise this will connect back to climate change. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, fun fact, if you have been a designated driver, you were directly impacted by Hollywood and the way that you live your life because Hollywood invented the designated, designated driver in America. It was a project called the Harvard Alcohol Project led by the Center for Health Communications launched in 1988. Uh, the goal of this project was to import the concept of designated drivers from Scandinavia, the only place where it culturally emerged as a natural thing. Uh, into the United States because drunk driving deaths were a massive problem way more than they are today. And all Hollywood studios and TV networks participated. Why? Because in the words of Grant Tinker, which I will read because I don't want to get it wrong. <laughs> you couldn't move enough billboards or skywriting or newspapers to equal the impact of a star like Michael J. Fox talking about designated drivers on one episode of Family Ties. And that is exactly what was happening in any sitcom or film or whatever uh, that was big at the time, whenever any scene of casual drinking was happening, whether it was in a home or in a bar or at a party in a club, mentions of designated drivers were intentionally included, not in a like, oh my God, don't drink and drive, that's so bad for you and everyone around you kind of PSA way, but more in a like, I was a designated driver last time, it's your turn to be a designated, I want a drink. You know, I mean, they're kind of normalizing the way in which it shows up in a natural day-to-day -day situation. And that snowballed. Uh, major political figures started talking about that terminology. Uh, laws were passed to make punishment of drunk driving much stricter. Private corporations started participating. Sports leaks, right? Like, what is correlated with drunk driving accidents? Sports events. Who wants designated drivers to become a thing? Car insurance companies like state fund insurance. And so they made a part of some of their core marketing efforts, right? Naturally, this was not coordinated by the Harvard Alcohol Project. It just started snowballing. Um, in fact, the little campaign launched in 1988, and by 1994, uh, traffic fatalities related to alcohol were uh, down by 30%. Uh, and by the late 90s, uh, most people under 30 had either been or had a designated driver. For that to sink into a culture that's all about freedom and independence, like a socially responsible behavior that is mindful of those other than you in America, <laughs> is a pretty big deal in less than a decade. Uh, and we have examples of case studies that were effective in less than a week. Um, and that's because culture change shifts all other systems. What do I mean by that? 
At the Ring Ring, we use the Pace Layering Framework developed by the Wang Yao Foundation as the backbone of our theory of, theory of change. Um, this framework, for those who are not familiar, argues that change at the upper levels happens faster than change at the lower levels, but also goes away faster. So change in fashion happens quick, goes away quick, a trend. The deeper you go into this framework, the slower it takes change, change takes to happen, but the longer it stays. And most interestingly, when I change something at a deeper, deeper layer like culture, everything above it changes with it, right? We saw cultural intervention around drunk driving that made policy much stricter, changed the way we do business. The Department of Transportation literally built new infrastructure, setting up signs, promoting designated driving and whatnot. And there were t-shirts for pub crawls saying, I'm the designated driver tonight from that time period. Uh, so fashion did change as well. And within culture change, we do narrative change, which as defined by USC, uh, the Norman Lear Center, which is the world's leading media analysis institution. Um, Narrative change is strategies that harness the power of narratives in entertainment, in news, in movement spaces, and in the broader culture to shift public mindsets and generate culture. And that work is extremely effective. And that is why fossil fuel companies invest about $750 million a year exclusively on climate change communications. Not just to do things like invent the carbon footprint, which British Petroleum invented, uh, because they knew they hired one of the world's leading marketing firms did research studies where they analyzed how blaming the individual for climate change leads individuals to paralysis rather than action. And so they framed that as the carbon footprint. But also, they film films, produce shows, shape collaborations with brands. This is 1939, the Disney Standard Oil Parade. Standard Oil, one of the big fossil fuel companies of the time, uh, wanted to associate its brand with a good and positive source of energy for the generations of the future, children. And that's why they collaborated with Disney on this campaign that wasn't just an animation, but posters and pins and et cetera to associate themselves to that brand. 1948, a uh, fossil fuel funded film, Louisiana Story, comes out, becomes Oscar nominated. This film was actually also funded by Standard Oil, fun fact. Uh, and it takes place in the Gulf Coast, uh, glorifying the lifestyle of two oil rig workers. That area of the world, the Gulf Coast, is now known as Cancer Alley because of the impacts that the fossil fuel industry has had there. <laughs> Julia Child uh, and the gas stove that the American Gas Association bought and funded. Uh, and they also bought her entire kitchen on the condition that she use a gas stove. Um, which we now know is really bad for climate change and for personal health, uh, that their campaign was so effective that this stove is uh, up for a visit at the Smithsonian Museum. Um, and here we have Shell. Uh, they funded Earth 2050, an entire documentary that came out in 2011 on the future of climate change. Of course, they make their own products and offerings part of the solution. And they collaborated with three Oscar-winning directors and leverage the in-house film production unit that they have had for a hundred years to produce films. Uh, fossil fuel companies don't produce films about oil. They produce films that glorify the lifestyle enabled by oil, luxurious travel, certain industries, and health, which brings me to this chilling example that is an ad that played this year during the Oscars, I'm seeing some heads nodding. You're probably familiar with it already, but I'll play it for you right now. It's time. What? Just everywhere to breathe. Home oh, dermot. Sally. Will. Not his fault. This is what a hospital would look like without oil and natural gas. And nobody wants this. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Check this out. Yes, baby. Baby, just like as I was saying, what else? What would be a hostel? What I have, what they need to keep us healthy. It was it save lives and deliver little bottles of joy. Products made from oil and gas over all around us, and without them, our lives would be a whole lot. Miss here. Thank you, Tom. I want to double back, yeah. This year. 
<laughs> this year during the Oscars. So, and I apologize, the video switching is always a little glitchy, but clearly the fossil fuel industry still turns to Hollywood today to influence public opinion. And it's time to do the same for climate change. Um, so, clearly, as we've discussed today, climate change is a crisis of culture. And I don't think I can put it better than James Gustav Speth, when again, I will read this quote because it's long. Um, I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Yeah. The truth is that all these bad climate things happening around us are happening because our culture allows it. And while we feel maybe individually bad about the small things we do in our lives also when it comes to climate, and of course it's the system's fault ultimately, but also we get to do it because our culture allows it. And so in order to change that, we need to address the root cause of the problem, which is our culture. We need to change the way in which we live in our day-to-day -day life. And so how do we go about doing it, right? Let's start by getting a little bit inspired. Um, with other case studies that have nothing to do with climate change, freshmen of Bel Air, who's seen that show? So research shows that audiences that have seen this show have measurably lower uh, negative feelings towards black people compared to audiences who have not seen this show. Uh, narrative change in action. Uh, Top Gun, who's seen that movie? The military funded it. It's actually one of the Air Force's most successful recruiting strategies. Um, UK, uh, Mr. Bates versus the Post Office. Who knows about this show? It's a very British show. Uh, basically, it's based on a true story about how in the 1970s, 700 post office branch managers were prosecuted for fraud because of the system, like the literal technological system, accused them of fraud. Um, and it turns out it was a system bug. Uh, and 700 families were ruined, and there was a show made in December about that, and within one week of its release, the Prime Minister of the UK publicly, in like online television, in front of Parliament, committed to reparations to those 700 families for impacted. One week. Uh, and Will and Grace, classic example, uh, yeah, is, uh, was so successful at normalizing gay relationships, right, that then-VP Joe Biden uh, said it was significantly responsible for creating the cultural conditions required for the Marriage Equality Act to pass. And that language is very important when you think about the type of work we do. Entertainment, I'm not claiming it's like this show came out and therefore change happened. It's the show or film came out and therefore it created the cultural conditions within which change that change makers have been working on for a long time can finally break through the gates of the gatekeepers. So activists, scientists, policymakers who've been pushing for this for decades, their work suddenly cannot be ignored because public opinion has shifted. So culture change enables change makers who are working at every other level of this system. Uh, and so let's talk climate and ground it at home. Uh, climate crisis is the biggest story of our time and the story we all have to reflect our reality, which frankly doesn't, but we also have to imagine riveting futures, like futures that I want to be in. I'm not a film by way, not a party from 30 years of our current vision. Um, and the truth is that climate change is missing from that reality. Less than 3% of fictional TV and film acknowledges climate change at all. Uh, like solar panels, fossil fuels, sea level rise, global warming, less than 3%. And less than 1%, actually 0.56%, use the term climate change. For comparison, on that 3% stat, the word Football shows up six more times in the same scripts and the word dog 13 more times. And I'm not saying less dogs and less football, I'm saying more climate change. Um, and so this ties to the work that we do at Good Energy. At Good Energy, we approach stories along the climate spectrum, which uh, welcomes writers into portraying climate in a different level of depth uh, from lowest to highest to most involved in a story. And I will go uh, into each of them with an example. So climate placement is when climate change uh, or climate-friendly behaviors, climate impacts, climate solutions are in the background of a show, not mentioned through dialogue, not acknowledged at all, but it's very clearly there. Uh, and I'll play this example from Black Mirror. So if you've seen Black Mirror, this is the Black Museum episode, season four, episode six. 
um, where this woman just before she gets into the museum charges her car with a solar panel and just moves on with her life, doesn't get acknowledged in the episode at all. And as you can see, it is filmed in a dilapidated gas station. Uh, so you can assume that in this future, fossil fuels are kind of irrelevant now. Uh, but they never say anything about it. So this can fit into literally any show or movie you've ever seen. But of course, it's more impactful when we have a climate mention. Uh, this is from Abbott Elementary, the episode uh, Mural Arts, season two, episode 11. Climate mention is exactly what it says. It's one that's actually mentioned in dialogue, and I'll play the video. Out for career day, and you see a mural. The mural you worked so hard on with your classmates. Your legacy. Now, in your mind's eye, is that mural really the Silly Sock family? Yeah, I'm mean, shit. All I am saying is, you like the Silly Sock show now, but... You might not even remember it in 20 years. But she has told us that we're all going to be dead in 20 years on climate change. I said, unless we act now. We're in school now. Are we supposed to act? Look, we are not doing a silly sock show, okay? <laughs> um, a great example of how climate change can be introduced through comedy also. There's this misconception that it always has to be a doom and gloom story. Um, one layer deeper is climate world, when the setting of a story is very, you know, evidently impacted by the climate crisis, but none of the characters' motivations are driven by climate. And so Glass Onion, if you've seen it, Knives Out Mystery, um, there is kind of a renewable energy source at the core of the story, but no one cares about climate change. It's like money and fame. <laughs> and evidently, as you'll see here. Well, can it be Wait a minute, Lyle. Why do you have the Mona Lisa in your living? In one week. I've invited world leaders and members of the press from all over to come to this island. And right here, I'm going to unveil the future. Notice this. No damn well we food. Slow it off. Stop. I don't. <laughs> I'm dropping. Oh, my God. That's a new solid hydrogen fuel. It's incredibly powerful. It's radically efficient. Zero carbon emissions and it's derived from abundant seawater. Call it clear with a K. That's just an event <laughs> that you're going to announce. Clear America. Our affordable home power solution, Clear, is going to be powering people's dreams all over this country by the end of this year. This I was clear. I told you I have two years minimum to test the stuff to see if it's safe or even viable. Clear or not, we can stop there for now, but <laughs> you got the idea and I love playing this clip in San Francisco because it's also a warning against this techno solutionist billionaire guru solving this problem for everyone, right? Um, and last but not least, uh, I apologize that I'm this much over time, uh, but wait a minute, Lyle. Uh, classic video change. Uh, we have climate character. This is when an actual character's core motivation is driven by climate change and therefore the entire story is driven by climate change because the story is defined by the character's, character's motivations. How to Love a Pipe White. I love this film. Uh, it's an indie film that I think gives more of a bank heist feeling to the climate crisis fight. Um, and you'll see exactly what I mean. I'll play this clip here. Welcome back to Blueberry Talk. Today, featuring myself to make a homemade blasting hat. If this works, it'll be step one, make our own improvise explosive. Why be headed to Texas for the winter? Once in Texas. It's a project. One kind of project. Has stopped pipelines from being built on my property. Poison the air, water, that they never did. Damn, this place is sick. You guys took your math in here? I'm ready to start working. Listen, stuff. We have to show the vulnerable the oil industry is by giving something big. Michael, what do you think the odds are you some that? I am really sure. Yeah, I mean, they blow the pipe at the hill time and you keep the oil from like it. I think actually think I'm not thinking about it. I'm doing things. Good in the spectrum. What if y'all do structural damage? 
structural damage is kind of the point. No. This destruction of federal property. Terrorists. American Empire calls us terrorists, and we're doing something right. You see, is let them take crap that's a mass death. No, their properties will be shrugged. Go, go! Go! The claim this was violence. Yeah. If that were done. Yeah. But this was justified. This was an act of self defense. I highly recommend the movie. If you kind of want a kind of inspiration slash palate cleanser, uh, just, uh, climate storytelling, um, and kind of the flavor that it can have. Um, but I'm not saying that like bombing the extractive is the new stealing from the rich, but it's a great take on it. <laughs> um, and again, Welcome back videos are always glitchy, but we have a whole playbook, a website. You can check out the website. We have like tons of different case studies for inspiration that we mind ourselves um, and TV and film, etc. We have all these different offerings through which we support writers. I'm not going to go into detail. I think this is the climate reality check that we were just talking about. So uh, March 1st, we launched the climate reality check, which is a Bechtel test for climate change. Instead of like the Bechtel test measures female representation in media, we measure the representation of climate change in media. And there's two questions that a story must, uh, you know, I guess, pass uh, in order to pass this test, which is one, climate change exists in the story world, and two, a character knows it, which feels very simple, but we spent two years developing those two questions on like 200 interviews with writers, showrunners, directors, executives, climate experts, media experts. Um, I know I'm missing something, but we had to make sure that this test was measurable, effective, and creatively generative rather than limiting because, of course, scientists want to take it more towards like, no, make sure they talk about how bad fossil fuels are or make sure they're not doom and gloom. But uh, we had to get in there. And so if you take nothing else away from this, remember that the most powerful person in the world literally is the storyteller. We shape culture uh, as storytellers and culture shapes all other systems. And Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Angel. If you like me, this thing cook, because now we're going to move on to the Q&A portion of this evening, and we will have all four panelists sitting here with us. So um, we're going to kick off with a couple questions, and then if there's time, we will move on to questions from the audience. Um, so the first two questions, we're going to ask them to a pair. And then the other two questions will be, you know, open in for y'all. And um, so I'm glad both you guys are speaking together. The first question is for Natalia and Spencer. Um, through the work that you do slash the problem that you aim to solve, what is something you learned that surprised you or that you wish was more publicly known about your discipline? Um, cool. Uh, maybe the power of peer pressure at we have a new panelist, so really welcome. Thanks for that. It's been in. Corey. Corey. Uh, the yeah, I'll do it. Um, the power of peer pressure. Um, when you paint an interesting picture of the future uh, and someone takes action, and this, I'm thinking of the example of Walmart, so they were a first mover on this beyond the bag um, circular economy work that I showed. Uh, it created a pressure on other uh, corporate entities to keep up because Walmart isn't the most innovative, um, well, they're innovative, but the most sustainable company. It would be different food, uh, like down to earth or Whole Foods or, you know, um, Berkeley Bowl. But because they were, um, you know, they're mainstream, they reach a lot of consumers and they set a lot of the price points, a lot of the, the sort of cadence for the, the sector. Um, them signing onto that project and then uh, continuing to be in it kept a lot of others along um and you know those are examples from from work with Dennett Cop. but um yeah the, the power of a first mover who has a lot of insulin to surprise me um this is gonna dovetail right into what Bruno said um all about but something one of like the first longer climate articles I wrote was about um a diorama at the 1939 World's Fair um, and it's called Futurama. 
and not the TV show. It was a physical kind of like ride that you would ride on. <laughs> and it was paid for at first developed by Shep, by Shell um, for an ad. And then GM took it on. And it was this famous designer at the time, Norman Belkedis, who like designed all the, the streamlined uh, like blimps and cocktail glass, all of these things. He was super famous at the time. And GM basically um, paid him to create this um, ride at the World's Fair. And at the time, uh, it was 1939, like there weren't highways in the Lindsay's big cities yet. And we created this kind of um, vision of the future. But what I think it was like in the 80s or, or something, or even like 1960 something that they projected out to. And he even said that he's like, I can't do the year 2000 because by then people aren't going to be driving cars. Um, and if you look at the images of Futurama, you're like, that is the future. But like, that's the world we live in now. And it's because that was such a successful storytelling um, example that it, like, led the way to the 1950-something Highway Act that like completely changed car infrastructure and our world that we live in. Um, and I think that that's just another beautiful example of what he, he was saying about storytelling. Um, and, and also I think there is like the, the hopeful flip side of that awful thing that happened. Like, I feel like we've been stuck. We're all stuck in this like little diorama that was created in 1939 and we can't get out by this certain point. Um, and of course, like all of that happened because GM was paying for it. And so like the whole point of it was that they're like, we're locking in infrastructure that's going to um lead to card supremacy for a century um but i think to me seeing these images were like our current reality was created by a designer in 1939 like we can do the same thing now um we just need to create an incredibly engaging and interactive vision of what that's gonna look like and i think people you have to kind of at the time, I think one last thing about it was like it really addressed something that was pretty missing. At the time, there were people were coming out of the Great Depression and it kind of like signaled the safety and, and luxury. Um, and so you have to ride the wave of like what is culturally missing right now. Um, and I think a lot of people are, are missing kind of fulfillment and, and connection to something larger than themselves. Um, and so I think um, there's something beautiful possible there. Thank you both. The next question is for Sandra and Bruno. Looking ahead, what does your most optimistic vision for the world in terms of climate action look like? And what steps do you believe are crucial to getting there? Mm -hmm. Oh, I got it. Thank you. I was just at an event before this about rewilding. And, um, and there, there's an organization that's helping tribes to get back their lands, the little land back movement. And um, and what's interesting is that, you know, the most indigenous mindset is not about ownership of land, right? Then the earth belongs to her. And I I think that, you know, in my ideal future, we all we all get back to this way of living that humans live throughout throughout our young evolution as a species, right? Frogs are what, like four, four million years old and sharks are like 10 billion years old humans are half so <laughs> if even you know so um in in our young evolution really getting back to the knowledge that the the elders in indigenous communities have and science is observation right so so hundreds of thousands of years of observation of natural systems and combining modern technology and, and thinking about like i love i love the whale like if if we are using AI to better understand our natural systems, if we're using it to better understand our own system, how how do we get back to those stories, you know, that have been passed down through oral tradition, through cultures? Because you're not if you tell like, tell your child like don't do this or that will happen, or you tell them the story, like what are they more likely to listen to? So these stories that contain so much rich wisdom and and getting back to the knowledge of how to be a good species right like everything in nature creates for for all the others around a tree doesn't would just create enough fruit to have a baby for themselves right if they create fruit for everybody to eat and fruit to compost it for the bugs and bacteria and soil networks they, 
there, there are so many ecosystems that form around each being, and we have this linear idea of waste where there's such thing as trash. That's, that's silly. So just getting, getting back to this. Thank you. Um, my most optimistic view for the future comes from a conversation that I had with a woman called Angie Abdilla. Um, she is an Aboriginal Australian futurist technologist, uh, the founder of Old Ways New, uh, an organization that uh, it's a design and strategy and futurism uh, consulting firm that is based on Indigenous Australian knowledge. Uh, and she wrote this book called Decolonizing the Digital, which, like, I, especially if you work in tech, I cannot recommend enough. Um, just either read the intro. Uh, I actually didn't read the whole book. I read the intro on some pieces, but the intro is so powerful. Um, and she told me that she regrets calling that book Decolonizing the Digital uh, because decolonizing has this sense of going back to something, to a, a time, to a way of living before now. Um, and she was like, at the time, that felt like the right title. But as I look into history and times where we've gone back to old ways of living, there's, <laughs> you know, like we don't, we usually in history go back to an old way of living. We move forward from where we're at and integrate the things that we have right now to like create this new future. Um, and this is the next piece that she's working on. The next book she's working on, it has that stance on it. And that's where I would say my vision is aligned. It's like bringing these things we've learned from this uh, boom that you talked about, right? Like it's a terrible boom to the side that might guide us towards extinction, but in this ideal future, these things that we risk to learn with extinction get brought back brought back to this way of seeing ourselves. That's not, and again, Angie Abdilla, I asked her, you know, is this world meant to be more individualistic or collectivist? And how is it in indigenous culture? She was like, neither. That also is a really broken binary. Um, because in our culture, we see humans as part of everything around us. Like, it's not that I'm alone or I'm part of other people. It's I'm part of literally everything living or non-living around me, uh, living or not, I mean, everything's living, right? But um, that's a long run to say it's applying the things we've learned right now to a value system that doesn't see us as separate uh, from nature, uh, where we're assessing whether we're individual humans or collective humans, or we're saying, hey, we actually are really part of this larger ecosystem and we can use this fiery innovation that we have not to burn things down, but to generate new things. And that's it. I have a little thing to attract. Yeah. My friend Cody Two Bears, who is one of the organizers at Standing Rock, um, he, he says, yeah, we want to decolonize, but we don't want to be against. We want to be for. So he calls it re-indigenizing. Yeah. Thank you so much. That is actually a really perfect segue into this next question, which is open to all. Um, for what you've heard thus far, um, in what ways can you benefit from one another's disciplines in regards to advancing your own goals? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, comfort here for this one. Um, part of what we do at Good Energy is connect people, connect writers and show writers, directors with people who have lived experience in certain things. Um, Good Energy was actually founded because our CEO comes from a hyper-religious family, her father is a uh, pastor of a mega church in Alabama and a massive climate denier. Uh, she grew up super conservative, part of the like young Republicans in high school. And she went to study abroad in uh, New Zealand, where the culture is much more connected to nature and just acknowledges climate change as a reality. It's not a debate. Um, and she came back like, oh my God, <laughs> like what has been going on? Um, and so she dedicated her life to climate communications. But have you heard or seen of the show Madam Secretary. Mm -hmm. So they interviewed her for an episode because they needed to understand a character who is a climate activist but has religious climate denying parents. And this often happens in Hollywood, like interviewing people with lived experience. And so Anna Dane saw that as a pathway for climate comms. She was like, what? Like, what? like, I don't have to do PSAs all the time. Like I can do Hollywood instead. And that's where she started Good Energy. And that all brings me to the people you work with are like amazing stories of lived experience. Um, and I think connecting would just be really cool to see how you can become part of a network of experts. And whenever a certain type of story request profile, et cetera, comes up, um, that'd be really cool to be able to tap into you and your network of the people you work with. Boom, let's do it. Do all that I got. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? 
I don't think necessarily we should actually do this, but it's fun to do mashups. So uh, what if there was uh, an immersive, maybe like a month long experience that we can invite people to step into uh, where they took on characters developed by Hollywood writers that are relating to climate change in different ways. Um, those characters went to Extinction Rebellion events uh, and talked about their stories and the ways that climate change is affecting them in the future. Uh, so now we visualized it because idea has to be in there. Uh, maybe we captured and we bring it to COP in the spaces that we convene or other um, places with with corporates. Um, and as as our concluding experience, you go and you immerse in the, the future on a regenerative farm, um, building out solar punk realities and, and thinking about once you're there, how to work backwards and, and, and maybe the people that you put through that experience need it the most. So members of Congress or um, uh, the executives on your list, um, your list. Um, and I don't know how we recruit them. Maybe it's a, a therapy that is prescribed. <laughs> Probably the ultimate murder mystery party. <laughs> when you do that, do let us know where to sign up. But sure. There's already a wait list sold out before its inception. Um, another question. Um, well, are there any questions that you have for each other? Can we hang out? Yeah, it's the farm. It's the farm. I don't know. Yeah, I have one kind of from y'all to the audience. Um, what is one lesson or piece of advice that you would want to share from your climate journey for someone that's just getting started or wanting to get involved? That's pretty typical one, but I feel like from all of your perspectives, be cool. Yeah, you don't have to have this specific area of focus to get into the climate movement because the climate movement needs everybody, right? The climate movement needs artists and designers and writers and as well as, you know, scientists. But I think creatives have a huge role to play. And and also we need to transform every single thing. So so being an entrepreneur, right? Like you don't have to go start your own thing. You can be an entrepreneur wherever you are. And um, and actually, I was I was talking to a gentleman um, who's native who got the giant global accounting for Baker Tilly to create an, an arm that works with tribes, and like that was hugely transformative. So like from like, you know, I'm I'm an accountant in a giant corporation, and right? like, what could I do? So so like wherever wherever you're at and your climate, journey, I'm curious how many people work in climate in this room. Awesome. How many people are climate curious? Look. Ah, sweet. So um. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a there's a place for everyone. Okay. Um, I'll follow next. Um, I think two things. Similarly, like, you don't have to be a climate expert to work in climate. We tell writers this all the time. Like, you don't have to be an expert in climate to tell a climate story. Um, you can just start with your own experience because we're all experiencing this crisis every day. Um, and but two, I think, something that really struck me... Um, I was interviewing Amy Westervelt, who is the journalist, the you know founder, head of Drilled Media. They report on fossil fuels globally, and like a lot of their journalists have death threats on them, so I have to keep moving. But crazy. But you should go on Drilled Media. It's really cool. Um, and she talked about how she was interviewing a conservative group of people that was filing a class action lawsuit against a fossil fuel company, and she was just curious about how you got conservatives to like do that. And you know we know from research run by Yale that 75% of Americans already believe in climate change, but only 40% of Americans believe that other people believe in climate change. What? Um, so it's already past the bipartisan divide, but to dig deeper into those motivations, she was interviewing this woman and she was like, why are you doing this, right? Like, why are you doing this class action lawsuit against this fossil fuel industry? And this woman was like, well, I hate environmentalists. <laughs> it's like how she started. Um, and she was like, I don't believe that climate change is, is caused by human-driven causes. However, what I do believe is what the lawyer showed me that is that since the 70s and 80s, fossil fuel companies have been filing patents for technology uh, that they're, they plan to develop once the Arctic melts to be able to drill for fossil fuels in the Arctic. Um, since the 70s and 80s, when they found out that this climate crisis and you know melting was coming, and it is unfair that they didn't let us prepare as well. Uh, they've been preparing since the 70s, and we're only preparing for the past five to 10 years, and that is unfair. And so 
The term climate justice only resonates with about 30% of America, uh, also research from Yale, but fairness as opposed to justice is a value that really resonates across the board um, as a way to talk about climate change. And, and I think that really struck me because it's like, I of course talk about climate change from my values from a justice oriented standpoint, but my recommendation is to learn to talk to people about climate change based on their values. You don't need to convince them what the cause of climate change is. You just have to get them on our side, you know, um, and that's it. We're getting time to Joy can share some what's with advice for people who are climate curious. I think I'm looking for wisdom. I don't know. That I, have, <laughs> I have anything more to share, but um, yeah, I, I like what you said about we're all on earth. So it's like whatever the unique talent or fire is then to, to follow it. But I, I'm in a place of questioning. So I would love to listen and learn. Yeah, I had a similar comment about just being like, everything is connected, so you you just need to work in wherever you are. Um, and I do think, you know, it's really important to keep the, that both truths can be true, that, you know, this is a huge systemic problem and we have an individual role to play. Um, and I do think that the individual agency is really important in, in finding momentum and in, in feeling participatory. And so much of our ability to feel like we're making progress is our ability to match where we're at with what like things we're tackling in the moment. Um, and so I, I do think that that, you know, having that individual practice is important and working on things that, you know, are challenging you to grow. Um, at the same time, I'm like, don't sweat. The, the plastic straw. I mean, it's important if we can get rid of it, but have eyes on the prize of this being a systemic issue. Um, but it's difficult to, you know, how do you intervene into a, a complex system? Um, a lot of that, in my mind, um, and Donella Meadows, who studies complex systems, would say, you know, a uh, the most, the best lever is the paradigm shift. Um, and so I think what we're all collectively working for. There's this great paper on um, social tipping points. You know, kind of we talk a lot about tipping points from an ecological perspective, but there's also the social perspective where this problem has been, we've been working on this for decades and decades and decades. At a certain point, we're going to hit a tipping point where it becomes the norm to care about these things. Um, and so I think the most important thing to think about is just like adding yourself to that to that scale on the other side so that we can get to a place where like the moment it becomes the norm, everything is going to become so much easier. So much of, of the difficulty with my climate journey and so many other people's climate journey is the scaling of isolation, of, of scaling outside of the system um, protecting you and, and, and feeding you in a certain way. And when you step outside of that, it gets, it gets much more difficult. Um, and just like, just small things like wanting to look cool or like where like go on a trip with your friends for buying places and all of these things become difficult and so i just i think yeah let's work toward that that tipping point so we change the norms thank you so much for being here and for sharing what's on your heart what's on your mind um i would like to open questions to the floor so you there um, you can either come to the front if you can. Otherwise, you're free to project your voice, and we'll make sure that we can hear you. Okay, cool. First of all, thanks for the presentations. They're amazing. And uh, yeah, keep the relationship good. The words for you all tonight. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, I was the best. That's what I so you, like, I heard a lot of discussion or like talk about, so I, I kind of see this paradox. So I'm curious what your thoughts are about it. But I hear a lot of discussion about like, uh, Imagining a future that is like captivating and attractive and much further worrying. They used to describe like a future that we desire. Um, and I, I think that like, at least for myself, my conceptions of attractiveness and desirability are already to some degree colonized. And so how do you think about like the work we have to do to like re-indigenize the imagination? And, like what that looked like, like. Is it possible for us to have like a future that is climate sustainable if what we all desire is mm -hmm. the house with the 
you know, multiple vacations here, et cetera, or like, and how do you do that work? Like in integrity? Yeah. That's something that, um, actually I was exploring a lot when I began my work in Haiti and, um, a TED talk called fourth world nation building. That's about how we're doing development backwards. So, so we have this idea that first world is the best and, and everybody else has fallen in step with that where, where they're like, okay, I want to have like in Haiti, there was, um, an indigenous, um, how, like a Taino house that has natural air conditioning. So, so it's, it's a house that has a hole on the top and then has a little chukun on the top and then air naturally circulates throughout it. But people were like, oh, concrete houses are better. The concrete house is a stove. You hug on the inside of it. And, um, and then those houses are the ones that fell and killed everybody during the earthquake in 2010. So if, if we're like, oh, everybody's supposed to be first world, like, and everybody's supposed to have a house in the suburbs with two cars and pave over everything on the way, um, then we're headed towards a planet Earth that's going to require, you know, we're headed towards 11 billion humans who each need eight planet Earths. <laughs> it's about, yeah, it's a, a certain destruction. But I feel like things change quickly. And once we reach that tipping point, you know, in, in climate, there's accelerating feedback loops. So the, you know, the methane gets released when the permafrost melts and then it's 21 to 80 times more potent than the warming agent in the atmosphere. And so, so when we hit certain tipping points, the, the cycle starts to accelerate really quickly. So what if we were painting a picture of fourth world development where like TEP, we're going forward, so we're going 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, right? They talk about the fifth industrial revolution it's happening right now. And, um, and so, so getting these ideas into our zeitgeist, I think is incredibly important. That's the role of creative, that's the role of media, that's the role of imagination. And, you know, I, I feel like there is a mass societal awakening that's happening right now. BLM, you know, catapulted, definitely catapulted my personal work, realizing how colonization has impacted my own internal narrative and how it's toxic to, to everyone, no matter what color or gender that you are, right? Like we, we've internalized these toxic narratives. And, um, and, and, you know, that in the span of a few short years, the amount of, of work and transformation that's happened, it really gives me a lot of hope. I'd love to add on. Um, I do think desire is, you know, obviously culturally created and there are, there's, I mean, this is going to be bucketed into a lot of different solutions, but one of them is that there is potentially just like actual superiority in the, in the solutions that are the best. Like, I think if the, the idea that you know car lifestyle has been become this aspirational thing but you talk to people that live in a walkable city like they'll tell you it's better can it is better it's like a city designed for a human not that we can't rely on that always being the case but a lot of those desires um can only be continue to be desirable because the harms are invisibilized and so it's part of that is you know we need to build empathy and that's also wonderful to believe in and work towards. Um, and ultimately, there might be a group of humans who aren't willing to let go of that vision. Um, and that's where Extinction, Re Extinction Rebellion and activism comes in. And ultimately, that's where uh, revolution can come in at a certain place where at least you might have a vision that is better for more people. And that's going to be a tension between, you know, who, who can cooperate and um, how you get more people on board with that vision. Um, uh, a lot of the work that I showed is meant for like the executives of companies. And so we have to, at least this is my perspective and I'd love to be challenged, but like to, to be in that room and have any credibility or to be able to start the conversation and kind of Trojan horse your way into like, maybe climate should be part of your 10 year strategy. I'd like, we find ourselves having to kind of or I find myself having to position with something that's palpable and can be digested in that moment and tailored to that person's experience. So then, okay, so then you see the cars and the, like, the stuff that you consume. Um, but there are lots of other groups that are doing futuring involving people that are like, from other cultures and other spaces. Um, I grew up in Hawaii, uh, and I'm not Indigenous Hawaiian, so I, I can't claim any part of that. But um, there have been like really large exercises starting back from the 70s of imagining uh, Hawaii as a place that is climate resilient and adaptive uh, and like using clean energy and, and like living closer to the land um, that people that are like ancestrally Hawaiian have contributed to along with residents. Um, and they are really different. Like it's like we have pagodas out into the sea and they're like solar powered and we're like fishing and there's like this communal thing happening and 
maybe even our like biology has evolved in the far future because we're like, I don't know if it's uh, scientifically feasible, but um, that visioning is, is happening. Um, and then the last thing is I think the visioning also happens not in the format or the language of futuring, but just like, what are people doing? And so there's a bunch of groups in Hawaii right now that are um, like rebuilding like seawalls in the way that ancient Hawaiians did rock formation. Then it's, it's like super resilient to um, like tides and storm surges and uh, the other brewery teaching, like how do you build structures out of on coconut in a way that's resilient. So uh, that is futuring. It's just, it's, it's vernacular and it's like a way of expressing this is where I want things to go by participating. So I'm looking for more of that too. Thank you so much. Does anybody else have a question we'd like to ask? All right, so we have three questions, and is that okay to cap it off with those three, and then we can um, wrap this up? Awesome. So, if, would you like to either speak up or come forward? <laughs> I'll project. I actually want to build on what you just said and ask a little bit about the process behind selecting the ideas that you actually end up presenting. Mm -hmm. Like, what is that balance between I want to be palatable to these CEOs, but also getting that put in the door to imagine a really different and regenerative feature. Uh, I'll be I'll be brief and happy to, to keep chatting. Um, Look at that. I do as a consultancy, there's lots of ways that we engage in work. Um, often the, the featuring is at the beginning of a strategy process. So we're starting to talk about like, I don't know, among many things that a company or an organization could do, what are some of the options? And then how do we start to narrow down and, and make progress on them? Um, so that's, I guess, the foot in the door, the beginning of a conversation. Um, and then the question is sort of like, what are the provocations or the uh, trends that will be most useful to that that group? Um, knowing that climate change is like the water that we swim in, everyone's going to be affected. It'll change like culture, society, economics. Um, so then we're we're thinking about like, okay, is the is the most useful trend to have this company shift and shape its action uh, going to be the stuff around like incoming policy or consumer preference related to climate change, new materials. Um, and so that's sort of how we get into like, what is the thing that, that'll be there? Um, and I think it's a balance between like inspiring, a little bit uncomfortable um, and somewhat doable. At least you could like draw the thread back to, to what's the strategy or the, the new thing that you're making today. Um, I think there's actually parallels to that in Hollywood um, where our organization is entirely positioned on being story first, climate second. Uh, when we work with people, because ultimately a storyteller's priority is to tell an incredible story. And if the way in which we are consulting is getting in the way of that, we're not doing right by the climate movement. Um, and incredible stories are judged differently than like a climate story maybe would be judged by, right? And uh, then you have the executive that's going to look at the story and be like, can I sell this? How many people does this appeal to right now? Um, X, Y, and Z. And so when we come in, we have to tell an amazing story and then we put climate change in there as kind of like velvet glove, iron fist metaphor. Um, and when I was at IEO, actually also working on responsible innovation, um, shaping the early days of that work that resulted in the like this work can't wait campaign. Um, it was similar, right? It was like, we need, a, we need to communicate that this is profitable first and climate second for most people to like give you an ear. Um, and so if, if you're a climate entrepreneur, like they're responsible to show up for clients, investors, et cetera, to so be like, I'm going to make you money and we're going to be good for the planet, not we're going to be good for the planet. So give me money. Um, and unfortunately that's kind of how it just keeps, continues to be. Um, we're okay. <laughs> I accept this faith, but I don't like leaving me, um, so we're enough. <laughs> uh, we have a question over here. Uh, that funnily enough is like very similar to the question I was going to ask, which is just like, I just came from another climate event and I feel like climate is so much about talking to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, I think one of the biggest challenges is trying to figure out how to invite people that aren't in our same mind space into it. So I was just going to ask what your guys' experiences are with what kind of trade-offs do you have to make? when speaking either with doubters or challengers or sticks in the mud or whatever. Um, but because that seems to be like a big moral internal struggle for people too, is to like 
you either are willing to make sacrifices to make progress or you are not willing to make sacrifices because that um it's just the sanctity or the purity of the work that you're doing we create a scenario okay i know it has mm-hmm. this is the other co-founder of solo compounds by the way yeah maybe i don't <laughs> <laughs> no. i was like um what <laughs> uh just i like i think the person who has done incredible work on this is Catherine hayho um she's a um christian kind of communicator and this is her bread and butter. And if you follow her on any platform, she's incredible at cross platforming. So she just like posts it everywhere. Anyway, she, I mean, going with your stat earlier where, you know, at, at least 70% of people are concerned about climate change. There's this perception that it's lower. And it's like, I think we need to understand that like the, there is an interest and people are very worried about this and that she does recommend for the, the 10 people she considers resistant who are just like diehards. She's kind of like, don't waste your time. Uh, and like she she had, didn't come to that conclusion lately i'm sure she thought about it for a very very long time um and her other piece of advice is just like meet people where they are and, you know find the fairness um value set that they believe in or find whatever value set they already believe in um because most people there's some very personal entry point for them to care so that thought one yeah, it depends on who you're talking to. If you're talking to farmers, start with the weather. Because everybody knows the weather is changing and the people who are closest to it, like, y'all know. You're, you're there every day with the lands and, and you can see it all around you. So meeting people where they're at. And um, yeah, love Catherine Hayo. There's um, there's also, you know, the, the idea, like to what you were saying, like people don't have to know how HTTP works to use the internet. People don't even have to use the internet to be influenced by the internet. So basically we just need to build it. Like look at how fast tech has taken over our lives. You know, like I had had um, AOL Instant Messenger. (laughs) It was was just such a huge transformation that's happened in less than one generation. So so I, I think that we really need to create that exponential transformation. We're not going to get everybody on board. The, um, Erica Chenworth, who a lot of um, XR's theory is based on her PhD research, um, says that 3.5% of the population um, participating in nonviolent direct action is is that tipping point. And um, yeah, who knows if it's exactly that, but let's, let's I should end. We're going to get there. Um, yeah, I'm Love Catherine Hano. Uh, she's also on our board of advisors. And something she says is like the most important thing you do for climate change is talk about it. Uh, because people don't talk about it. That perception that other people don't believe in climate change is because people don't talk about it. Um, and uh, in terms of tips of how we approach those conversations, it's almost like, like negotiation tactics <laughs> of like um, getting to know, like aligning your interests with theirs. Right, and which means you first need to understand their interests and their values. And I think that with virtue forward issues like climate change, I know that I find myself really tempted to impose my virtues on other people right off the bat and be like, "This is climate change; it's a huge problem. Why don't you believe in it?" Obviously, not in those words, but like in that sentiment, I think it happens. Racial justice happens. Climate justice happens. So many places. Climate. Uh, yeah, kind of fair enough. <laughs> um. But it's that, I mean, my, my biggest advice is get to know their interests first, because that's where you're going to find out if they're like a diehard denier, that's not worth investing in, um, or someone who's like on the fence and you're like, oh, hey, like, odds are you're experiencing the climate crisis and you just haven't thought about it, because at this point we all are, whether it's because there's less butterflies where you grew up, or it's hotter or colder, um, but it's happening somehow. And if you live in Texas, your textbooks just ban climate change for a big election. So that's just, it's happening everywhere. Um, Thank you so much. We have one question in the back. So, um, so we're telling climate change. Uh, so um, the most recent example that I've seen uh, in the past about um, storytelling with climate change has been to the movie Dose of Up which is kind of a psychological thing on how an asteroid hits and that kind of be used as a metaphor for climate change. Um, so my question to you is, do you think that the way storytelling needs to progress 
in Hollywood or how we perceive story, even around that, in order to land that cultural shift that you were talking about? Um, or like, what, what's like your take on that form of storytelling? Um, yeah, Don't Look Up is like a t- tough one for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Don't Look Up is an allegory for climate change, right? If you haven't seen it, it really is. Um, and research shows that most people didn't immediately make that connection upon watching the film. It was the marketing effort after Worries that like helped people make that connection. Um, and so as good energy, and then as myself, I will answer. Uh, as good energy, we don't consider allegories part of our work. Um, that's like up to a writer's creative, you know, expanse, how they translate the values and the elements of what's happening in a moment of the climate crisis into something parallel. Uh, the virtues of that is that similar values are being transmitted to society of this, of like, wow, I watched that movie and I realized media is kind of annoyingly positive and veering away from tough issues. Um, the negative side is that some people like, for the impact, the, the like scientific neurological impact of storytelling to take hold, like you need to see characters who care about the things you care about uh, or who are as aspirational and care about things that you maybe don't feel about right now that you're like, they always be more like them. Um, and, and don't look up. They actually do mention climate change once in the Oval Office scene. Uh, so it does pass the climate reality check yeah. as a climate mention. <laughs> um, but uh, and it, it's, it's very briefly mentioned and by like a not aspirational character. I forget his name, but it's like the assistant of Meryl Streep. Uh, it was like, oh, we have end of the world meetings all the time. Sometimes it's climate change. Sometimes it's biohazards. Sometimes it's like pandemics. Uh, so what are meteors now, right? And like, that's literally how it gets mentioned. Um, and so good energy's position is like, it should be more explicit uh, for it to be effective. Uh, my position is anything that shifts our values <laughs> towards that direction is great. Like. Um, and even as good energy, like we're not going to tell people to not do allegories. They're just not our clients. Uh, we don't support that type of work because we're not well suited to, we didn't design ourselves for that. However, again, personally, I think that, you know, Adam McKay works with us. We respect him deeply, um, producer of that film. And, uh, we know that his intention was value shift and perspective shift on something that like people are going to welcome more openly, like a meteor that is apolitical. Um, as opposed to climate change. So one yeah. good way of saying like, mm, oh. it's not either or, it's and, um, but good energy works in specific dimensions. Okay. Um, would any of you like to add anything to that? It, it, it was quite specific. <laughs> 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 um, with that, I am happy to hand it up to Justine so she can send us home. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you so much. Very good time. It's been a good work. So we thank you all so much for sharing your stories and insights. I feel so much of the time um, there, we think there are so many barriers to action um, and decision, perceived lack of resources or time or just like not knowing where to plug in. And I feel like you all showed us some really good inspiration how we can do that through art, storytelling, planting seeds of cultural change, um, provocations for the future, creating community. And so, yeah, thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank uh, Maria for snapping photos tonight. Ooh. And Paul for filming the whole thing. So we can watch lots of waiting to them others. And thank you to Haley and Bethany from Jessica Lasky Catering. They helped provide us food and kept us all really, really well fed. You saw the beautiful spread out there. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and also thank you to all my housemates for letting us host this event in our home. Make that that's always great. Hi. Um, if you're curious about living at Agape or hosting events here, come talk to me afterwards. Um, but yeah, we're free to hang out here for the next uh, little bit. Um, get more snacks or drinks, and then, yeah, just talk with hey, each other. Last flag. Yeah. And 
I'm hosting an event also in a beautiful mansion living room um, for Climate Week on Friday. It's going to be uh, regenerative intelligence. So some folks from Project Drawdown and um, Lila June, who's an amazing PhD indigenous activist and singer. We might have some musical performance there too. So would love to see y'all. And he said, thank you. Thank you, Godfrey. <laughs>